Happy New Year, everyone. To mark the occasion, here's my review of Wasteland 3 for PC, Mac, Linux, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. What you're seeing here is, of course, the PC version. This is a party-based role-playing game by In Exile Entertainment that was released in August of 2020 for PC, Xbox One, and PS4, with the Mac and Linux version following in December. Much like with the previous game, In Exile decided to crowdfund it, this time going through Fig, and they initially thought they were going to release it in 2019, but ended up having to delay it ultimately to August of 2020. And when the game finally did launch, it was generally pretty well received, apart from some pretty hefty technical issues that the game launched with. But now that the game's had a few patches under its belt and the dust from its initial release has settled, how is it as a role-playing game and as a sequel to Wasteland 2? Well, let's go ahead and start delving right into it and find out. And like always, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation. Now this does run on the Unity engine, which is the same engine that powered Wasteland 2 as well. And not only is this running on a more recent version of the engine, which has more technical capabilities, but it's obvious that In Exile clearly learned a lot from the development phase of Wasteland 2 and took those lessons to heart for Wasteland 3. Because in addition to the typical things you would expect having jumped forward several years in development, like much improved modeling and texture quality, better particle effects, much better lighting tech, None of it comes at the cost of performance, and it is a much more stable game than Wasteland 2 was. I have seen a fair few reports of people having crashing issues around the time the game launched, but since then, and since a few patches have come out, I haven't really seen all that many reports of major technical issues. Mostly mild annoyances more than anything else, and those are still the kind of things that they can iron out relatively easily. In fact, throughout the time I spent playing Wasteland 3, which included doing pretty much every side quest in the game, at least the ones that I could find, and going through the entire main story, of course, I only ever ran into a single major glitch, and that was on a side quest I found while I was wandering around in the wasteland, and I did some things out of order, which eventually led to the quest breaking and not ever being able to recover it. So I'm not really sure what happened there, but since it was a side quest, I'm really not that concerned about it. I just know that if I go and do that side quest again, I just need to make sure to do things in order. And while I'm not going to spoil the side quest for you, if you're concerned about running into that side quest and not doing things in order, it's the one about Sam. Trust me, you'll know when you see it. Anyway, I'm digressing a bit here. The point is that the improved version of the engine, as well as the clear lessons they learned from Wasteland 2, resulted in considerably improved visuals, as well as considerably improved stability. And there's even some really nice touches in there, like when you're talking to certain major NPCs, and the perspective changes from the top-down view you get for most of the game, and goes into a much more personal one, where it shows that character talking directly to you, and it's legitimately surprising just how good the animations are during those sequences. The way the characters move and the way their faces are animated actually ends up being surprisingly natural for a game that is as stylized as this is and for a game that you're used to viewing from a much further out perspective and thus are expecting something a lot less detailed. Obviously, because of the general perspective you're getting through the vast majority of the game, it can get away with not having super top-of-the-line visuals, but it's nice that when it goes into those more zoomed-in perspectives, it actually looks really good. Now, all of that said, you do still have to keep in mind that this is a party-based role-playing game played from a more top-down perspective, and that the graphics are not going to be cutting-edge or anything like that. The graphics look good for what they are, but outside of those moments where you're talking to major NPCs and it shifts the perspective, over, it is fairly unlikely the graphics are going to outright impress you. It's really more the aesthetics of the game that carry it than the actual raw visual quality. But the situation is not quite the same when you move over into the sound design, which generally speaking is very well done. The weakest element of it is the sound effects themselves, which just get the job done and get it done reasonably well. They're not especially impressive, and the gun and explosion sounds certainly aren't as beefy as I'd really like, but they're solid enough to where it's not really a problem. It's really more the voice acting and the music that this game shines with. Unlike in Wasteland 2, where only some major characters had voices, in Wasteland 3, every character except for the custom party members is fully voiced. This not only goes a long way towards helping to increase the amount of immersion you can get in the game, but a lot of the characters are voiced very well, particularly major characters like, of course, the Buchanans. And that strong voice acting really does help to convey the atmosphere that the game is going for whenever it's going for certain feelings, and it varies between being rather serious and downright goofy with surprising grace. 
And accompanying the strong voice acting is a very strong soundtrack, a lot of which was composed by Mark Morgan, and which has a very nice atmospheric vibe that is considerably more gloomy and cold in feel than what you saw in Wasteland 2. Obviously, with the switch in location, that makes a lot of sense, and that is pulled off rather well. And in addition to the strong atmospheric tracks, there's also a lot of vocal tracks, which are very interesting because they run the gamut from old folk songs and hymns like Down in the Valley to Pray to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, on up through grim versions of the Green Acres theme song and Land of Confusion, and even a choral arrangement of Welcome Back, Cotter. It's the kind of thing you look at on paper and think it's completely ridiculous, but then you start actually playing the game and seeing the context that these things come up in and understanding the world of Wasteland that it actually makes sense. And that also contributes very strongly to the atmosphere in this game. So they did a fantastic job with the presentation overall. It's just that it has a few issues here and there and some of the technical issues haven't quite been ironed out yet. But of course, what really matter are the story and the gameplay. And the story in this is that you play as a squad of desert rangers that are sent from Arizona to Colorado to meet up with a guy named Saul Buchanan, who has promised aid to the desert rangers. You see, since the events of Wasteland 2, the desert rangers have lost their headquarters and are running ragged on a very minimal amount of supplies and need some sort of relief. Thus, they desperately need the aid that Saul Buchanan can provide. The thing is, he of course would not do this without seeking some sort of payment, and in this particular case, he's calling upon the Desert Rangers to help him with a problem that's come up in the Colorado Territory, where he is currently the main leader of the area, known as the Patriarch. His two sons, Valor and Victory, as well as his daughter Liberty, have all basically rebelled against him in some form or another, and are ultimately trying to wrest control of Colorado from him. The deal is relatively simple. The Rangers need to put a stop to Valor, Victory, and Liberty's rebellion, and if if they're able to do that, then Saul will send supplies out to the Rangers in Arizona. Thing is, even though this sounds relatively simple, things go wrong almost immediately and you find out very quickly that the situation in Colorado is considerably more complicated than it was made out to be. The Ranger expedition sent up to Colorado gets ambushed on the way in and gets mostly massacred with you being some of the few survivors of the incident. And when you eventually do make your way up to Buchanan, you find that the deal is still on and he provides you with a base of operations as well as a selection of personnel that can help you out with things like acquisitions of gear as well as learning the political landscape and things like that. And from there, you are set loose into the Colorado wastelands to go about your mission as you see fit. Along the way, of course, you will run into a wide variety of characters, some of which will actually be able to join your party, and others of which will present you with either opportunities or dilemmas or a mixture thereof. As I mentioned, you very quickly find out that the situation in Colorado is very complicated with a lot of factions vying for control of certain areas or even the entirety of Colorado, and along the way you're ultimately going to have to decide who you want to align yourself with and who you want to support versus who you want to either destroy or diminish, and the decisions you make throughout the game will have lasting impacts both on the world around you and ultimately the outcome of the story. Even sometimes seemingly insignificant actions can have pretty lasting impacts Impact, so you do need to be careful with what you decide, and with the sheer amount of options available to you throughout the game, you can find yourself in situations you didn't really expect. For example, I actually beat the game by accident about halfway through my actual playthrough. I had been doing a bunch of side content and mostly leaving the main story elements for later and finally decided to go about doing story stuff when I ended up getting a certain encounter. And since I had just saved my game a few moments before and wouldn't really lose any progress if something went badly, I decided, what the hell, what happens if I decide to pick a fight during this encounter instead of talking my way out of it? Because I had been talking my way out of pretty much every Everything up to that point. So I get into this fight, and it was clearly a fight I was not supposed to win. The odds were overwhelmingly against my party. I was pretty high level for that point, and I was pretty well equipped, but it wasn't end game gear at that point, and I certainly wasn't at end game levels or anything. So it was a fairly tough fight, and I ended up getting a lucky critical hit on an enemy robot, which meant that since I was going for an aimed shot against that robot, it ended up going berserk and targeting its allies. It proceeded to make very short work of its allies, I finished it off, and then once I got out of combat, it started going through the endgame slideshow and playing the credits, and I was like, wait, what just happened? Turns out, by winning that fight I wasn't supposed to win, I actually ended up getting the win condition, so... 
Yay! Of course, I did end up reloading the save and playing through the rest of the game proper and getting to the proper end game and all that. But it was still incredibly amusing at the time, and I was really glad I recorded it. Up until the hard drive containing a bunch of my gameplay footage, including everything I had gotten for Wasteland 3 up to that point, died on me. Needless to say, I was not at all happy about that particular turn of events, and I had to go back and re-record all of the footage that you are seeing in this video now. But that particular moment stuck with me, not just because the fight itself was actually really cool to go through because of that incredibly lucky critical, but because it's indicative of what In Exile was going for with the general philosophy of the choices and consequences and the options that you are presented with throughout the entire game. Very, very few quests will railroad you into doing anything. There's almost always many solutions to any particular problem, whether that be violence, diplomacy, maybe a medical solution or a technological logical one, there's all sorts of ways to solve a wide variety of problems in the game, and depending on the way you solve things, the world will react to it differently. And that includes your own party members, specifically the companion characters that you'll find that can occupy two of your party's six character slots. The other four slots are reserved for custom characters, starting with the two you create at the very beginning of the game, and then with an additional two that you will get once you get to Ranger HQ. Since these four characters are more or less blank slates as far as characterization goes, then really it just matters what you ultimately decide during the dialogue and such as to what their actual personalities are, you have to think of them more as avatars for the player to mess around with than proper characters. The other two slots actually have proper characters with their own personalities, their own agendas, and their own reactions to all the different things that you're doing. They may or may not like the decisions you make, and will certainly comment on them whenever you make those decisions, but some of the actions actually go too far for whatever that character's sensibilities are, and they might just abandon your party outright, or if the action is severe enough, they may even violently turn on you and you have to gun them down. So it definitely behooves you to be mindful of the decisions you're making, because your actions do have consequences, and those consequences can be very severe. And while you may not know what the consequences of those actions are until much later on in the game, or maybe even during the end credit sequence when it's giving you the slides on what the ultimate outcome of everything was, you can be sure that by the end of Wasteland 3, not only have you made decisions that will influence the lives of the direct people that you're coming into contact with, but also decisions that will have influence the ultimate outcome of the Colorado region. And while that of course makes this a proper role-playing game, that doesn't mean it does it flawlessly. There are certain instances where you are presented with a binary choice between one of two different scenarios, and I'll give you an example from the very beginning of the game so this is not going to spoil much, but you are given the option of going and rescuing a convoy that's currently under attack, or you can go and rescue a family that's currently under attack at their homestead. You have to pick one or the other. You can't can't do both, and if you decide to do neither, then they both fail as soon as you go and do something else, because that is actually a timed quest, and the game didn't exactly make it clear that that was even a thing possible. But it's more frustrating than that, because it's actually the only timed quest in the entire game, at least as far as I could tell, because I could go and do basically anything else in the game without any sorts of time restrictions, whereas once this quest comes in, if you go somewhere else it automatically fails. Now it's fine to have timed quests in the game and it's fine to have situations where you have to pick one thing or the other and you can't do both so you have to make a difficult decision, but what's not so good about it is the way it tries to bring that decision back to you later on. You see, if you pick one of the options and you just continue on your way throughout the rest of the game, later on a character will show up that will basically try to throw this decision back in your face and take you to the option opposite location of the one you picked and show you all the devastation and say, see what you did, what you caused, this is horrible, you need to go inside with me so we can avoid this thing. Now if it were handled properly, then you could say that the character is trying to make the party wake up to the consequences of their actions, but you've already been seeing the consequences of your actions well before this. And more importantly, you've been interacting with this character several times before this moment, and it really just comes across as a pathetic attempt at trying to guilt trip the player into going with one particular story outcome, when up until that point, you actually haven't had all that much reason to go with that option. 
You see, the way the story actually turns out, and I'm not going to spoil the particulars here, just give you a broad overview, is that you basically have to decide which faction you're going to side with by the end of the game. And while it does make sense that the Rangers would ultimately have to pick which faction they're going to support, there's only one option that actually makes any sense, and while I'm not going to spoil which one that is, it's going to be pretty blindingly obvious to you when you're playing through the game. Now don't get me wrong, it's nice that the game gives you options, and that does give you quite a bit of replay value for going back and trying things with very different decisions and see what the ultimate outcome is, but it's pretty obvious that the game is nudging you in a certain direction the entire time, and if you decide to go with any of the options other than the one it's nudging you towards, you are ultimately picking what is going to feel like a lesser option, because it's just not quite as developed as that one particular path. But while this is a bit disappointing, it's not enough to tank the entire experience. For the most part, the story of Wasteland 3 is handled rather well, and it does end up being interesting throughout. And there's plenty of side content where you can also make decisions that will influence the outcome of the region, as well as some of the factions that you're dealing with, and that is all pretty interesting as well. For the most part, the dialogue is well written and well acted, with a few sour lines here and there, which is to be expected in a game with this much voice acting in it. And that signature mix of handling certain things in a very serious light while also having a very dark sense of humor about other things, or even having some things that are just downright wacky, is all present and accounted for. And when you bring all of that together, it means that the writing in this game is one of its biggest strong points, even though it does have its issues. But this is a video game, and it's not just about the writing. So what about the gameplay of Wasteland 3? Well, if you've played Wasteland 2, this is going to be very familiar to you, although there are some notable changes. There's been a fair bit of streamlining and fat trimming between Wasteland 2 and 3, so for example, there were three speech skills in Wasteland 2, smartass, kissass, and hardass, whereas in Wasteland 3 there's only kissass and hardass. The weapons have been consolidated into certain other skills, so shotguns and handguns are both combined into small arms, whereas assault rifles and submachine guns are now combined into automatic weapons. Bladed weapons and blunt weapons have been combined into melee combat, and energy weapons have been combined with other effects to perform the weird science skill. The demolition skill has turned into the explosive skill, and it covers not just thrown and placed ones like grenades or landmines, but also rocket launchers and things like that. On top of all of this, the field medic and surgeon skills have been combined to form the first aid skill, and there have been some tweaks and changes to some of the other skills. For example, mechanical repair has just turned into mechanics, whereas computer science has turned into nerd stuff, outdoorsman has turned into survival, and perception has turned into actually just a value that's calculated instead of being an outright skill. There's also the new sneaky shit skill, which combines the alarm disarming skill from Wasteland 2, but also also includes a bunch of extra things for stealthy characters like additional critical hit values and such like that. Then of course there are skills that return pretty much intact like brawling, animal whisperer, barter, leadership, sniper rifles, and toaster repair, and then there's also two additional skills that expand upon the weaponsmith skill from Wasteland 2, which are weapon modding and armor modding. The attributes, coordination, luck, awareness, strength, speed, intelligence, and charisma all remain more or less intact from Wasteland 2, but there are some slight tweaks to what each individual attribute does, but there are also some larger changes to the attributes owing to some pretty significant changes in the way that particularly combat functions. For example, turn orders are no longer decided by combat initiative because combat initiative is no longer a thing. It's you take your turn, the enemy takes their turn, and friendlies take their turn after that. This means that if a stat affected combat initiative in Wasteland 2, it simply doesn't in Wasteland 3. Action points are now ultimately determined by coordination rather than a mixture of stats like they were in Wasteland 2. There's also a pretty significant change to the intelligence attribute, which gave you additional skill points on every level up in Wasteland 2, whereas in Wasteland 3, it doesn't give you additional skill points on every level up, but rather gives you a bonus skill point whenever you hit an even number when you bump up your intelligence. 
This might seem like a bad thing to you at first, but when you take into account that they have streamlined a lot of the skills and there's a lot less skill spread in this than there was in Wasteland 2, it does end up working out. There's also a fairly significant change to the perk system, which did exist in Wasteland 2, but it gave you a perk point every four levels. In Wasteland 3, you get your first perk point at level four, and then from there on out, you get an additional perk point every two levels. These perks will give you permanent bonuses, but also will unlock certain certain abilities during combat depending on which skills you're unlocking these perks in. So for example, if you have the big gun skill and you get it up to a certain point, you can spend a perk point to get the suppressing fire ability which allows you to blast a wide area with a debilitating effect. And while reaching level 25 will give you the mastery achievement, technically the innate maximum level seems to be around 35. Because as you continue to level up, the amount of experience you will need to get to hit to the next level is also going to go up rather dramatically, especially once you hit very high levels, and there's just not enough experience in the game to get beyond level 35. As you continue to level up and bump up your skills, obviously you will become much more capable combatants, but you will also be able to access new things. So if you bump up your nerd stuff skill, for example, you'll be able to hack into more advanced systems. Or if you bump up the lockpicking skill, you'll You'll be able to open additional containers or unlock certain doors that you couldn't ordinarily unlock. Getting additional points in the mechanics skill will allow you to conduct more advanced repairs and thus also be able to unlock new things. And of course, getting additional points in sneaky shit will allow you to disable more advanced alarms and getting additional points in explosives will allow you to disable additional mines as well as disarm traps. Sometimes you'll even have opportunities to use these skills during dialogues, which means that in addition to being able to use kiss-ass and hard-ass to influence the outcome of a conversation, you might also be able to use things like barter or first aid, maybe weird science, maybe nerd stuff, it just depends on whatever it is you're talking about. So it behooves you to stat out your party so you have at least one representative of each individual skill in the party, and that's all you really need because dialogues are handled on a party level. You don't have to have have the one person talking that has the mechanic skill to be able to use it in that dialogue. This all feeds into the vast array of options available to the player for deciding the outcome of a given situation. Do you want to go for a more diplomatic route? Do you want to do something that's more related to your skills? Or do you want to go in guns blazing or what? It's up to you, really. Skill tests are all handled in a very simple manner, that being, do you have whatever the requisite skill level is to do this thing? If so, it succeeds. If not, it fails. There are also certain items that require you to have a certain level in a given skill related to that weapon to be able to use it effectively, but unlike the skill tests where it's a simple pass-fail test, you can equip a weapon that has a higher skill requirement than whatever your skill in that weapon type is, but it gives you some really nasty debuffs unless you have that particular requisite skill level, so you can't really use it anywhere near as effectively as you might hope. But if diplomacy and skill tests fail you, or you're just feeling particularly bloodthirsty, then there is always the option of combat. Now it is worth noting that even if you are trying to use as many skills as possible to avoid combat, you are still going to have to engage in certain battles no matter what you do. It's just unavoidable, so you just need to be prepared to engage in combat anyway if something goes wrong or if you just end up in one of those unavoidable encounters. Combat in Wasteland 3 is a pretty straightforward affair where you move your characters around on a grid format for the maps and you can have them take cover behind certain objects which will either give them half cover or full cover, with full cover obviously being the preferable option if it's available, and that will make it harder for enemies to hit that character. Each character in your party has two weapon slots that they can switch between freely. There's no action point cost for switching weapons. And on your turn, you'll have them move around, take cover, use whatever items are in their quick slots. If they need to reload, you can have them reload. If not, then you just have them attack or use special abilities that they've unlocked. All with the goal of completely annihilating the enemy in whatever manner you see fit. Usually in a particularly gory fashion, because this is Wasteland and that's just how it rolls. As I mentioned before, the combat initiative idea has been removed from the game entirely, so it's your turn, followed by the enemy's turn, followed by friendly's turn. And these are all AI-controlled 
friendly characters like animals or the clone that you'll see running around and smacking things on occasion, or even just NPC allies that happen to be there for a particular fight. And all of this is handled with an action point system. Now the number of action points available to a given character is based on their coordination attribute, and obviously the more action points a character has, the more they're going to be able to do in a given turn. Certain weapons and certain abilities require considerably more action points than others. For example, brawling and melee attacks have rather low AP costs, whereas sniper rifles and big guns and launchers and such require quite a lot of action points. And while you will start out in the game not really having a whole lot of options for various abilities and weapons and such, as you continue to progress through the game, obviously you will unlock quite a lot more abilities and weapons, and things will get a lot more interesting. You'll also be going up against enemies that are a lot tougher than the ones you've run into at the beginning, and some of which will remain dangerous even if you're at end game and have your entire party decked out with some of the best weapons and armor as well as tons of abilities. Now it is worth noting that I first played through the game on the normal difficulty, and on that setting, most of the fights were very manageable. There were a few here and there that were relatively challenging, but if you level up enough, then it's never really much of a problem. If you stick to the level recommendations for all of the quests, you will find that the game has some challenging moments here and there, but for the most part, it's not especially difficult. I did have to go back and get additional footage from the earlier parts of the game, so I did a whole new save on the hard difficulty, and that did bump up the challenge a bit, but it wasn't really a major jump over the normal difficulty. I do imagine that if you play it on Supreme Jerk, then it does end up getting quite a bit more difficult because they significantly bump up the enemy's ability to hit you, as well as their ability to score criticals and do massive amounts of damage to you, but that's more of a cheap difficulty than anything else. In fact, if anything, Thing, this game is surprisingly forgiving in its difficulty. I mean, sure, it does have some challenging fights here and there, and you are going to need to be mindful of certain enemies being weaker to certain attacks than others, like, say, robots being much weaker to energy weapons than just basic projectiles. Well, at least until you get the anti-material sniper rifles, but that's beside the point. But if you manage to make some mistakes and a character ends up being downed, that doesn't mean that they're dead. They do have a couple of turns where you can go and revive them and they'll be able to get back up and get back in the fight, although when they get revived they only have three action points upon that particular turn, so basically you just need to get them in cover at that point. And your characters can survive being downed in a particular combat scenario a few times before they are ultimately killed. That doesn't mean it's a good idea to just let your characters constantly be downed, because whenever they're downed and then revived, they come back up with a critical injury that has a pretty significant debuff and needs to be removed by an injury kit. But the point is that between the weapons and abilities that are available to you, as well as the ability to heal your party up, and in certain scenarios you can even bring in the vehicle that you can drive around the wasteland in, and that can blast things with a turret and be this massive damage sponge that enemies can attack, and chances are, if you are going up against particularly large and powerful enemies, you're going to be able to use that vehicle in that fight. It all means that Wasteland 3 is never really an overwhelming game. Sure, it can have a few frustrations here and there, but for the most part, it is a very manageable and extremely accessible game, much more so than Wasteland 2 was. It does a rather good job of explaining how it works to the player, and the interface is considerably cleaner, easier to work with, and frankly, just outright better than Wasteland 2's was, not to mention having considerably fewer technical problems than Wasteland 2 did and being considerably more immersive thanks to the full voice acting. But that's certainly not all to say that the game's perfect or anything like that. I've already mentioned numerous problems that the game has, and I'm about to say one that is a pretty major detriment if this is something you were looking forward to. One of the game's advertised features, and something that a lot of people were definitely looking forward to, is the co-op mode, which allows you to play through the story mode with a buddy. And basically the way it works is that one player will control certain members of the party and the other player will control other members of the party. The player hosting the game is still going to be making all of the main decisions throughout the entire game, so it really just means that the second player is just kind of there to help out during combat, so it does mean that the co-op is very disappointing. What's even more disappointing is I can't get it to work. 
Your options for hosting and joining a game are extremely limited. Either you can use the lobby system, which from my experimentation only seems to work with the same version of the game. So for example, if you have it on Steam, it will work with other players who are on Steam, but if they're running, say, the Windows 10 Store version of the game or the GOG version of the game, it doesn't actually pick them up. But if you're both running the same version, let's say you're both running the Windows 10 Store version or you're both running Steam or you're both running GOG, it doesn't really seem to matter because the system may still not work. It seems to have a very difficult time actually finding available games, and I'm not really sure why. And the only other option is Direct Connection, to which I have to say the early 1990s called they would like their networking system back. But even attempting it that way with people I know who do actually have a copy of the game, I still haven't managed to get the connection to work, so I simply can't comment personally on how the co-op system actually plays out. What I can tell you is that I've looked up some responses to it, and apparently it is very laggy at absolute best, and it has a whole bunch of technical problems associated with it. So if you were really looking forward to the co-op, that is going to be a massive disappointment to you. Personally, I don't really care. Role-playing games are really primarily a single-player experience, and any co-op mode in any of them is just going to be a nice bonus at absolute best. The only exception to that rule would be if the game was designed from the ground up as a purely co-op experience, and in that case, I'm not entirely sure how you could make that work without it severely impacting the role-playing aspect of the game, where you're actually making decisions and seeing those decisions play out over time. I mean, look at it this way. There is a reason that the vast vast majority of role-playing games that do happen to have co-op in them only let player 2 help out during combat and require player 1 to make all of the pertinent decisions. I'm certainly not saying it's impossible, but it is something that would have to be designed from the ground up as a co-op experience, and Wasteland 3 was clearly not. Wasteland 3 was clearly designed as a single-player game, and the co-op was added later on, so it's not really that much of a detriment that the co-op doesn't work. And in fact, when you bring everything together, even with the issues that this game does have, it is still an absolutely fantastic role-playing game that any fan of the genre, and especially if you are a fan of Wasteland, should play. And between the very high quality of the game, as well as the considerably higher accessibility than Wasteland 2, making this a very good jumping in point if you are unfamiliar with the series and are looking to get started with it, Wasteland 3 manages to not only fall into the 4.5 out of 5 category on my scale and thus come with an extremely high recommendation from me, but based on everything that I messed around with in 2020, it is actually my game of the year for 2020. So if you've been looking for a really good RPG, Wasteland 3 is definitely worth a look. Thank you all very much for watching, and if you like the kind of videos I make, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Everything I get from that goes directly back into the channel, whether it be getting additional games for review, or additional equipment, or replacing broken equipment, or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that's perfectly fine, I understand. But the option is there if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, welcome to the new year, and I will see you all in later videos.